Hello there, and welcome to episode 2 of my tutorial series for Age of Wonders 4. In this Let's Play series, we are going to go today through the next steps of expansion. While episode 1 covered the very basics of scouting around and building that city, understanding how the army works uh, and its uh, basics and all those things, today we're going to go for our bigger goals now. So, we know the vicinity a little bit, and the next major milestone in our empire building will be to select a spot for the second city. Because we are allowed to have three cities before the game will push penalties on us. Cities are quite important, because not only do they give you the ability to raise troops, they also give you various incomes that you need to overcome your enemy. Quite obviously, it's a pretty good thing. So, what does define a good spot for a city? First and foremostly, you should be looking for those little things here on the on the ground. Not stuff like these, this is just a one-time pickup, but things like these. Deposits, magical materials, I'm going to talk about these in a minute. And also quite interesting spots are wonders. Wonders are basically unique grids that when you have conquered them, as you see here, it, gain, it it will give me some Imperium, some knowledge, and it will even power up the city the more quarries we got there. And we even gain some extra units to recruit. Wonders, they basically all work like that. They always offer a unique thing for the city, and often the, the wonder can define the character of a city quite... Uh, quite strongly. So here, well, I personally think it's a quite obvious choice. I think you might have already noticed that I've been, that I've been hovering around this area for a while. I think this is a very, very good spot. We got access to iron, a pasture, gold, magical material, fire forged stone. These are really special. I'm going to cover why um, a little bit later, but first and foremostly, it's enough to know that you get a lot of production. This is just like two iron deposits in one thing. So very, very, very desirable. Magic materials are upgraded versions of these. Here we have another magic material, which gives us mana. So this area here is uh, really waiting to be picked up. Other factors that you should take into account when selecting your city is also the terrain. But more about that in a minute when we're when we're done with the research. So we have researched Baneful Curse. That's really, really good. So I'm going to go for this enchantment here. This is a unit enchantment. As you see here, currently it would affect nobody. If it does affect somebody, it uh, you have it written down like that. But this extends the racial skill of my evil faction to basically everybody who's not part of my evil faction. The racial skill of ours is to be able to hit enemies harder that are weakened, and extending that on more people is, is pretty desirable in my humble opinion. Okay, so we're sitting on quite some gold and some mana currently, so we should change something about that. My city has completed the tier 2 town hall. This is, for this faction, especially important. By the way, this is where you can find out what's been built in the city. So, the tier 2 town hall does give us some extra gold. It gives us uh, province annexation range, so that means the higher the tier of the town hall, the further the reach of the city. But most importantly, this dark culture is able to ignore negative city stability. So I want to explain that real quickly. So city stability is basically the happiness in your city. And the catch here is that every expansion of your city will give you a little bit of a cum accumulating negative uh, score of city stability. That means the more provinces you have claimed with your city, the less stability you got. And stability is in several levels, so it goes into positive and negative levels, as you see here. And the negative levels, well, they start quite harmless, they lower the income, but the last level is really devastating. It uh, cuts the income in half, and it might even throw provinces off of your city. This is really where you're not want to be. So the Dark Culture has, in its Tier 2 
Town Hall integrated that you can ignore all these things. These things will not happen if your city is unhappy. That means you can grow as big as you want to with your dark cities. This is a really, really important trait. I'm going to demonstrate why a little bit later. For now, it's enough to know that this is a special thing about the uh, dark culture. Every culture has these specialties. It's worth knowing them. So we also gained access to new units, and this is where I want to spend my money on. So we got access to Night Guards. Night Guards are spear units. They are quite special. First and foremostly, I want to talk about the standard things of a spear unit, so or polearm unit. So first off, they have first strike. So their retaliation attack will come first. They also deny shock troopers their um, special ability to cancel out retaliation attacks. They are like, nope, you're, we're still going to stab you. They also do extra damage against cavalry and large targets. So pole arms are not only good in retaliating, therefore they are pretty good frontline, but also really cool to use them against mythical monsters because they tend to be large creatures. So this is true for all pole arm units and the entire game. So whatever faction you play, wherever they come from, this is true for all polar mutants. If they have that icon, this is true. So what's special about these guys is that they come with a interesting skill at Stark Stalwart. If they end their turn next to somebody, they will most likely shred down their resistance as a tad bit. So these this makes these guys to my ideal frontliners will stand the ground and be annoying as hell to overcome for the enemy. They also come with a standard called the weak thing. 20% more damage to weakened units and you gain regeneration if you attack a weakened unit. So weakening is extremely important as a mechanic for a faction. Regeneration gives us uh, 6 HP per turn. Really, really powerful. So the other unit is the Warlock. The Warlock is a battle mage. Battle mages are pretty cool. They are also suffering from accuracy, so they need a clear line of sight, ideally, and they cannot use this their ranged attacks if they are melee bound. True for all ranged units. Also, battle mages aren't too... Uh, they don't have a, 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 a that many special skills like the polar units do. They always come with a magical attack. Typically, it deals also magical, magical damage. There can be exemptions, there's just too many units in this game. But what's really, really important to note about these guys is they inflict weakening with their ranged attack. So ideally you want to pelt the enemy first with these guys and then send in your melee guys. The Sundering Curse is also really cool. It has a 6 grid range, that's a lot, deals 24 damage. Needs all action points, so that means your Warlock is not allowed to move before using that. But on top of this pretty high damage, it also sunders down the enemy's resistances and weakens them yet again. So your Warlocks are really, really important for your army. They enable your melee units to deal even more damage and enable their resilience mode as well. Because that regeneration is as important as that damage bonus for weakening, in my opinion at least. So, we already got, in our base army here, one Warlock. This uh, guy was uh, is has joined our army because we got one of those traits here, I bet. No? We had that by basic? Well, there, there are many, many factors that influence what your base army is composed of, but seeing a tier 2 unit at the beginning of the game isn't isn't unusual at all. So, our city here will now grab that gold vein, because I want to have access to that gold, and I'm going to pick quarries yet again. Today I can also show you why. I have finally unlocked the Dark Forge. The Dark Forge is going to be a improvement that I'm going to apply on one of those provinces, and it will imp increase the its income by every adjacent quarry or mine. Therefore, that's what that was the reason why I was spamming quarries wherever I was able to. Mines would have been eligible too, but this was because I knew that I had access to the Dark Forge later. This enables us to de to dish out troops much, much faster once this thing has been built up. So we probably want to slap that up right there. So just you go there and then you right click on the province that you want to build it on. 
So here we go. This will take a couple of turns. And usually I don't go for it that early, but I meant to illustrate it here. It's a tutorial after all, and that's also the reason why I went for a low difficulty of this uh, in this series, because I wanted to be able to show you those things and not to be worrying too much about being overrun by the enemy at some point. So I'm moving now my troops to this location so we can start building a city. Meanwhile, my scouts are swarming through the lands. I want to talk about the scouts here today. I didn't talk about it in episode one because I didn't want to have too much information at once, but it's really worth noting that you have these little icons here. This is a, These are so-called medals. I have no clue why they are not here in the list. It's easy to overlook them, but what I want to point on here is that Dark Scouts come with Rock Camouflage, Swamp Camouflage, and Forest Camouflage. That means in these three terrain types, the enemy is unable to see your troops. So currently, nobody except me is able to know that this guy is standing there. You can utilize this pretty nastily, because when you set a unit on top of a province upgrade, you can pillage that stuff. And if you if this province happens to be in one of these three terrain types, if they don't have true sight, which is a possible upgrade, they will be not able to counter your scouts. I'm going to fletch in a little bit more dark culture specific knowledge in this uh, video series, obviously. But um, yeah, there is something for every one of these factions that's worth knowing about. And that defines your playstyle a little bit more. With the Dark Faction, your scouts are obviously extremely potent tools of guerrilla tactics. It's worth noting that. Okay, so our dude is now sitting in the vicinity. So I unselect everybody and I just left click here on the map to open up the province grid. So as you see here, the whole land is divided in those, into those provinces. This is basically what the cities access later on. And so now we're selecting where we want to slap down that city. I think it's safe to say that this is a pretty good spot and I'm going to expand my main city more into that direction, so there will be plenty of land to grab for this new city here. The wonders are a little bit far off, probably we're not going to, able to be able to grab them that soon, but since I plan to build a really large city, that's totally okay. So I think this is a pretty okay spot to start on, or this one, or that one, well... I think I'm going to start here. So we are now moving the hero over here. Now you click the province and select build outpost. Costs you 50 gold and can be only done by hero, except if you are barbarians, then you are allowed to do that with scouts too, but that's an entirely different story. So that thing now will be set up without us doing anything. So our dude Necron has his hands free to just roam around and kill some stuff. So I'm not going to record every fight here at this point unless it is showing something that needs talking about. <laughs> so we have now also the ability to summon those Phantasm Warriors. I want to summon one of these guys and show you next turn why. Okay. So here we have found another infestation. And we got a, another request from a city there, the people of Gray Square. So here we get again the ability to trade or resources for friendship with these guys. But I'm going to opt out because I'm not too interested in friendship. But I gotta say, it is very, very, very much worth it. So the game now notifies us as we have no new things to unlock. Check out that green exclamation mark. So, we can now reduce the upkeep of tier 1 units. That's a really, really powerful trait. We are also able to gain knowledge from every free city that we got a Whispering Stone deployed on. And we get the ability to gain more research points whenever we skill, whenever we research something new. This thing comes with a catch that the game will now select for you what the optimal research will be, but the optimal research will always be cheaper. 
it's it's not bad, but uh, it's also none of my favorite traits. We also get now the ability to go for excavation underground. So you might have already noticed all those underground passages around us here. So if you click that uh, thingy here, there is an entire map below the map, usually, unless you have a world where that's turned off. So this uh, upgrade allows you here to dig out some of those provinces. This is basically the trade you need to, ex to have a subterranean empire, which is totally a viable path, but not for our run here. Just wanted to show you what it's all about. So I'm going to buy me now this impressment skill because lowering the cost of my troops, I am now gaining more gold per turn. That's always a good thing. And I have enough money or Imperium to buy me another one of these skills. I'm going to leave it with 200 because I already know that I'll need 200 Imperium to found a city later on. So the summoning spell is ready and the summoning spells are really cool. And as you see here, there is a vicinity where we can cast it and where we can't cast it. Most importantly, our main hero and or armies can be reinforced by summonings. That's a pretty, pretty cool thing to know. So we're going to bring that guy down here because we want to join that fight. So the Phantasm Warriors are shield units. Shield units excel at defensive stats and they have a special defensive mode. This uh, type of unit always has the ability to buff everybody around them with three points of physical defense. Support units have the fitting uh, skill to that. The supporters skill works the same, just with magical resistance. So that means this guy is able to bolster up or frontliners by just standing behind them and going into defense mode. That's pretty cool because they can buff the defenses out of the second row. They also have pretty standardish values here they are after all only a tier one shield unit nothing not too much to be expected but i was happy to summon one because the dark culture doesn't feature any shield units natively okay so we're going to go in there and let's see what the auto combat spits out i'm not too happy with that so i'm going to do that manually this is one recurring theme in this game that I really love to try it with the auto combat, but the auto combat is really, really notorious in being extremely reckless, and therefore I highly recommend you to give it a try, but most of the time you will have to play those fights uh, manually. So I'll fast forward this one, because here it will be a bit, pretty basic strategy. I'll let the enemy come and then I run into them and smack them. It's a small scale fight, and there is not that much to learn, so I'll see you after that. All right, that has been a slightly different outcome. By merely letting the enemy rush towards me and just attack them, then the AI is really bad at that. And uh, I, I personally don't mind because it does give you an incentive to do things more, more smartly there. So sometimes, though, the enemy doesn't want to fight against you just like that. Here, this is happening because we are much stronger than them. You can, of course, force that fight. It is good if you want to maintain an evil alignment, which has several good things if you want to have that. But here, I love this one because we will be able to gain just some mana by letting those creatures go. This is one of my favorite ways of resolving events like these because it is gives us the ability to stock up or on our stockpiles without taking any risk because usually you wouldn't get any mana as a loot. I also want to show you one more cool thing here. As you notice here, this guy has no more movement points, but that one Phantasm Warrior here is now able to fight into these guys. And if you follow the red dotted line, you notice that it's still inside the area and therefore it works out. I love to uh, use this because this way you can totally maintain the um, upper, you can be very, very flexible if you have two or three stacks like that. I could be also splitting up this guy's army to utilize these this effect even further. It's up to you. So I'm going to uh, do this little thing a little bit more smoothly, and then we're going to talk about that city.
So that's been more like it. So by the way, if you feel like I'm skipping too many of those fights, please let me know in the comment section. I just do my best to uh, keep the, the runtime of these episodes as compact and interesting as possible. So we have a level up on our ruler and I'm going to cover that in a minute because I want to skip forward now a little bit in the turns. So whenever your ruler levels up, they gain a new ability to to learn. These can be magical, combat or supportive skills. And well, this gives you the ability to enhance a little bit more the hero's play style, you know. So we're going to head on over real quick to our main city. And as you see there, the province improvement already kicks in. Those troops are being recruited in a massive amount, in a massively fast pace. Okay, that's just what I wanted to see. This is uh, why it was a pretty cool move to get for go for the uh, Dark Forge initially. And now every single grid here where I will be able to build one more is going to improve on that. And the first enemy has saying hi to us. So when you're, when you're seeing your enemy for the first time, you can send them a welcoming gift, which will give you a plus 50 bonus on the positive relations. So diplomacy would be a own topic because we are playing evil, we can skip most of it. I just want to mention that if you hover over the personality of a ruler, you can find out how to maintain peace with them. If you send them a welcoming gift, that's one thing. If you give them a threatening welcome, you make it easier for them to, uh, lure, to be lured into war. So we're going to say goodbye here. I just want to mention that it you might be wondering why things like these happen so they uh, worsening their relationships now with me by insulting me and uh, creating so-called grievances these can be used to make a justified war so you might ask yourself now well what's the difference between a justified and a non-justified war it is like uh, if you are going into a unjustified war you will be sliding towards the evil alignment and the thing about being evil in this game is actually most of the time you don't want it to be because you have a higher bias of negative event outcomes as far as i know that's something that most of the time you want to avoid if you're not specifically picking traits that makes that make it good to be evil but let's get back to the outpost so when you have an outpost you can found a city out of that by investing 200 imperium into it but you can also go for expanding it into another province. So currently we're uh, only getting the income of this uh, center thing and we can expand that on another work camp. If you afterwards build a city, you will keep the expansion. So it's basically going to be a city with an extra population. You can set up palisade walls and a watchtower to make more defensive options possible and to have more vision range. All of these upgrades will be implemented into the outpost. Note that the outposts don't count into your city limit. So you can have as many outposts as you want to. That's one really important thing to know. Outposts can be therefore used to claim rare resources that are a little bit out of your reach and stuff like that. But um, they will cost you some gold and they will need you to have a hero in the vicinity. So there are some prerequisites to, to cover that. So the outpost will now be transformed into a city in three turns, and then it will be the same thing like our main city, basically just like missing. It's going to be the same, except for it's going to be missing the fact that it's going to be that this is our main throne city which has i remember correctly here this building so this building is only available in your main city it has insane income bonuses and comes with a uh, innate fortification health which makes it harder for the enemy to conquer that city i'm going to explain how sieges work when it's time for that but uh, one thing at a time. So I'm going to keep that warlock here inside the city because I think it is about time to think about a second army, you know? It never hurts to have a second army in your, uh, at your disposal. So I'm recruiting now another shock trooper, another archer, 
and then we got four units already available. So I'm going to talk about this army when it's uh, time for that. We have unlocked that new spell, which allows us to expand the Call of the Weak skill on other troops. And we're going to go for that Wayfinder enchantment next, which will basically make all, all of our scouts just move faster. It's pretty useful, and I love to have it, and therefore we're going to fall back on it. So, let's just uh, clear out this little nest here. And this, for example, is one ex uh, is one uh, go with auto combat where I'm totally okay with it. It really depends a lot on how uh, the enemies are are set up. Sometimes the AI can just overrun the enemy, and then it's quite easy. And sometimes the enemy is just composed of uh, troops that require some finesse to lower the um, casualties on your side. It is just a little bit different. So now I'm going to do something you usually shouldn't do. I'm just going to skip ahead one more turn. Never do that. You should always use your turns entirely, but I want to put a point to this whole city thing. So we have discovered one hostile city below us. Now that's pretty interesting because that means we can totally rate them, but uh, they seem to be not too accessible. Alrighty. So let's skip ahead. Like I said, usually don't do that. We got that new city here. So, and we got the last leader there. We're going to ignore Frost Queen Artica for now. And we say hi to our first quest. So after a while, you will receive quests. That's pretty usual. So here, our quest is a little bit unusual. They want us to build three farms and I personally like to go for these quests because the rewards are most of the time worth it. That mystery bonus is really much worth it and we will also gain some stability bonus for our cities. Note that while our cities might be immune against negative stability penalties, we are not in immune against positive uh, mood bonuses. So. That's one thing to note. So we're going to say hello to that one. And as you see here, we have now 25 turns time to do this. So we're going to go on over here. And I want to utilize one of the wonderful things of the Dark Faction. So we can, you can spend Imperium points to attract population. This works everywhere. The more points you have already on the counter, the less Imperium points you will require. So we can do this here. And in all honesty, we're going to go a little bit ahead here. Those farms, I found them quite useful for the things that we are ought to do here anyways. It'll make that city here grow faster. So we grab these things. But I also want to note here that in this city now, we could invest all of our Imperium into expanding this main city without any penalties. This is one of the major trademark moves of the evil faction because they are really the only people who can just ignore how much uh, negative bonus they uh, or negative bonus negative uh, penalty they allocate here so this uh, th this makes them one of the cultures that can build the biggest cities out there without uh, crumbling on on that so that's the almost the end for this episode let's just uh, set up the bill here and you see Due to the fact that I used my Imperium to boost myself to population 3, I already have ticked off the box that I need to build the tier 2 town hall. So we're going to build it by a workshop, the town hall, and let's say we're going to go for that stonemason. So we have a really high production income. And then for something else here, and we're also going to recruit ourselves some troops. I'm going in here quite aggressively, but I always follow a philosophy. I rather spend my money instead of sitting on it. And that's where I leave today's episode. So I thank you so, so much for watching. Next episode, we're going to continue our conquest. Probably we're going to conquer Gray Square, so I can illustrate how warfare works here. Or, yeah, I think this should be something that uh, sounds pretty okay for the next episode. Also want to go over wonder conquering, but one thing at a time, my dear friends. So, 
Leave me your comments down below. If there are any topics that you want to see covered in the upcoming episodes, let me know. I know that the um, order of things in these episodes is really all over the place and it's not possible for me to follow the uh, main topic in in the first 10 minutes and deal with it but i really try to have this series on a high information density level so i hope you like it feel free to leave a thumbs up if you do and consider subscribing there's also a playlist link down there if you want to follow the entire playlist of this uh, let's play series knock yourself out click that link and you will see whenever a new episode is hooked up in there as well Big thanks to the supporters of my channel. I really, really appreciate all the things you do. And if you want to check out how you can follow that as well, there's Patreon, PayPal, and Buy Me A Coffee as ways and means to get there. Links are down below. Again, thanks for all of you who are doing something there. And thanks for everybody who watches these videos until the very end. This is, this is really, really heartwarming. So have a good one. I hope you have a wonderful day and see you next time.